This is Limitless Spirit, a practical, inspirational, and thought-provoking weekly podcast about the impact of faith and Christian identity in today's world. And now here's your host, champion of Jesus and people who love him, world traveler and co-founder of World Missions Alliance, Helen Todd. Welcome to this episode of the Limitless Spirit podcast. COVID-19 pandemic has affected every aspect of our lives, including our minds. The isolation, uncertainty, and financial loss, and also confusing messages coming from reliable and unreliable information sources take toll on all of us. But what about people who struggle with anxiety and depression? Depression is the world's largest health problem. It accounts for more disability than any other disease worldwide and is number one reason for the rising worldwide suicide rate. The stigma that comes with the issues of mental health often prevents people from opening up and seeking help. It is especially difficult for people of faith who feel shame in looking for help outside of the Bible and prayer. After conversations with a couple of friends who struggle with depression intensified through the months of quarantine, I decided to reach out to Dr. Jen Thomas again. She's a clinical psychologist and author and a Christian. So we are going to discuss some important questions today. What is the best way to deal with anxiety and depression during these challenging times? How can our faith help us in this struggle? And what steps can we take to help and protect our loved ones struggling with depression? Hello, Jennifer. Thank you for being on the podcast again. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. And I'm glad to be back talking to you and your listeners. Well, I think we're going to touch on an important subject today. I know that as a clinical psychologist, you help people who struggle with depression. And I have been wondering if this pandemic is putting extra stress on people who struggle with depression, anxiety, and substance abuse. And especially, I've been thinking, who are the people who are at risk uh, with that? And then I started digging into the statistics on depression, and it's overwhelmingly has been stated that depression is the world's largest health problem all around the world, and the United States is among the lead countries in it. Why do you think is this? Well, what we know is that happiness is not directly related to like socioeconomic status or availability of resources. Like research has shown that people in the happiest countries don't always have the things that we have here in America. And so depression seems to be a separate animal from just having enough. It's a sadness, a heaviness. It's like a dark cloud that follows you around and it doesn't really depend on your circumstances in a sense. The cloud can come around at any time. And it's also very persistent and hard to get rid of sometimes. And so, as you mentioned, I'm concerned about my clients and many others at this time as we're in the shutdown and we have a loss of control along with people who may be having these dark feelings. And so we want to be sure that we're reaching out and checking on people who have a tendency towards depression and to make sure that they're doing okay. As a professional, do you think depression is a physical condition, an emotional condition, or perhaps a spiritual condition? I think it's all of the above in some different ways. There's a complex model that they call the epigenetic model, which says that it's caused by both genes and environment. And I've found that to be the case. And uh, we're learning more every day about the genetics that are, are behind this. And we see a tendency for it to run in families. But there you have both genes and environment at play. But even when they look at studies of twins who are reared apart or separately, they are more apt to either both have depression or neither one have it. And so I do like to share that with people if they carry some guilt of what's wrong with me, why can't I shake this to let them know, well, just as diabetes runs in families, then depression may also run in your family. And it's not your fault, but there may be things that you can do. Cognitive behavioral therapy is something that I offer and a lot of therapists offer. And also having spiritual resources and 
a pastor that you can turn to in these times and certain spiritual books or Bible verses that mean a lot to you may help get those clouds to lift. Do you think there is a connection between depression and anxiety? I know we're in a situation right now where there's so much uncertainty and anxiety. So is anxiety, does it go along with depression or they can be separate? A person that has anxiety does not necessarily struggle with depression. Yeah. If we think back to school and the math we took, they use Venn diagrams, which are the overlapping circles. And what we think is that some people have just depression, some have just anxiety, and there's a lot of overlap. So many, many people have both. And they'll usually have one that is predominant, like anxiety causes more distraction from their everyday tasks or is more problematic for them. Whereas for other people, depression is the thing that's on sort of the front burner with anxiety on the back burner, but the anxiety is still present. And in terms of people's safety, I do worry about the depression if it's so heavy and oppressive that people feel suicidal. Whereas with anxiety, it's hard to live with, but it doesn't often take people's lives. So it's not as critical of a condition. Mm -hmm. Have you felt in your practice that depression has gone up in its intensity or maybe numbers like among your patients? It's hard to say for sure, but I do think that where some people were kind of teetering, functioning okay in their daily lives, but where they've had a loss of job, maybe they're furloughed, maybe they're very worried about their finances because of that. All this loss of security and stability that we typically have here in an industrialized world, then I do see depression as a result of sort of the rug being pulled out from under us. I definitely do. I was doing a little research on that, and it was interesting that there are conflicting reports. So on one hand, there are reports that the numbers of calls to the suicide hotline has spiked. On the other hand, I read an article that said that actually the people who struggle with depression are feeling better in this situation. What do you think about that? I've heard something similar regarding anxiety, and it, in a way it made me chuckle because they said, you know, People with severe anxiety, it can be like the chicken little who always says the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And And now it is falling. And and now it is. Or they're very, a subset of people who have anxiety have OCD and are very afraid of germs. And so now it's like the rest of the world has joined them in their concern about germs. And so whereas maybe they've been invalidated over the years for having such a, a dark outlook, there may be some validation now of, you see, I told you so. And now they have community or companionship in their worries. I see. But I don't think that would affect the people with actual major depressive disorder, which is not, as you mentioned before, necessarily linked with anxiety. Yeah. With the major depressive disorder, yeah, I do think it's triggered by life circumstances. And so it makes sense to me that the suicide hotline is getting more calls from people who maybe have been on the edge financially or for whom their financial security is very important and they see their portfolio going down. And for some people, especially if their job is ending or they have a company that they're afraid is going to fail, that can be really devastating. So we talked about, you know, receiving spiritual help to help cope with that. Even before this pandemic started, it seems like in the news media, there has been a lot more reports about Christians and specifically pastors being affected by the major depressive disorder and several high profile suicides among the pastors that happened. And it seems like you know, do you think it's affecting pastors more so than maybe other people? Yeah, I've been sad to read about those high profile losses that have occurred. My assumption is that it happens, you know, across time. If we did a study of it, that pastors are probably right in line with overall depression rates and suicidal rates. It may be somewhat higher because 
you can make an argument because they have the burdens of others to carry as pastoral staff. A few years ago, there were a few pastors who lost teenage children to suicide. And so that was in the news a lot. So I do think there's somewhat of a reporting bias where the once the news cycle notices this pattern, then they're going to report when it happens again. And it looks like, oh my goodness, there's this real problem with pastors committing suicide. But for the time being, I see it as just part of the general problem of people committing suicide and not being able to take advantage of the resources that are out there to support them. And that's why I'm so glad with your podcast today that you're talking about the problem of depression and that we're going to let people know that you don't have to suffer through this alone, even in the midst of a shutdown, that there are resources out there to help. And I agree with you that probably the news media focuses on that because it seems like it's more scandalous, you know, when a pastor commits suicide. And I found it interesting that two of these pastors, they've struggled with depression and they even consulted people on depression and helped people with depression, and yet they were not able to cope with it themselves. So My question is, for people of faith, you know, for those of us who have Christian faith and we have this help available to us through the scripture and through just our faith and hope that we have in Christ, so do you think this is not enough? Does it speak of the fact then that there has to be some other help like medication maybe or counseling? What do you think about that? Yeah, when I see clients who are relying only on their faith and who maybe have a a level of discomfort with going to a counselor or considering a medication, I tell them, well, what you're doing is sort of white knuckling it through. And that does work for some people. Most people, if they can get through a depression safely, it will eventually lift usually um, after maybe six to eight weeks. But the problem is that it comes back as well. And every time that they're in that depressed state, there's a risk of suicide. And so I prefer for my clients not to white knuckle it, but to do what research has shown helps the most, which is for some people, medications, and then combining it with cognitive behavioral therapy. And I've seen people who do that, their outlook changes. They find that things that used to worry them or get them down are not as bothersome and they don't feel as weighty as they did when they were just white knuckling it and trying to get through. So that makes me ask two questions. Number one, and I'm going to ask both of them before I forget. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Number one, is depression curable or it's a chronic ongoing condition? And number two, there has been so much controversy about the medication and the antidepressants. So I want us to touch on that too. But first, let's focus on the possibility of it being completely cured. Have you seen cases like that? Trying to think of an exception. No, I would say the rule is that if someone is prone to depression, they continue to have those cycles. But the depth of the cycles and the frequency can be reduced with the combination of counseling. And for many of my clients, they also benefit from having some antidepressant medication as well. Although I want to say that I don't prescribe medications myself. I'm a PhD, not an MD, as you know. And so, you know, I I work in partnership with psychiatrists and I've I've seen the benefit. Some clients come in and their whole demeanor is changed. Their mood is, is much lighter. And then we work on those cognitive behavioral skills. Like there's a a problem for some people where they have negative self-talk. They have catastrophic thinking, which is, it's what it sounds like. They catastrophize about things. And so the work of a counselor or psychologist is to help them recognize those automatic thoughts and to try to have a more positive outlook and to increase their ways of coping so that when the next cycle comes, they might be able to continue to function and not sort of pull into themselves and withdraw and have their world become um, very small. In fact, some can't even do their work at that time. They just really retreat to their bed and pull the covers over their head, which is miserable for them and also for the family members 
and bosses who are depending on them. So no, I haven't, I haven't seen a cure yet. And then, so there has never been a case where a person has been completely depression free. I have not seen it happen. Of course, they probably don't come back. <laughs> right? Yeah. Some counselors might say that they've seen it, but yeah, our our sample is the people who come back to us. Exactly. We will pause here for now. There is nothing shameful about the struggle with depression. It is not a personal flaw. Neither it is a sign of a spiritual weakness. It is a battle, sometimes a lifelong battle that requires partners to help and appropriate weapons. There is no shame in reaching for help if you feel like you're losing this battle. Don't fight it along. Like Dr. Jen said, don't white-knuckle it. If you have a loved one who struggles with depression, call them today. Talk to them, ask questions, and listen to their answers. I'm posting links in the show notes to uh, several helpful resources. Depression is like a filter that Satan puts on your perception of life. It distorts your reality to the point that it becomes unrecognizable. It doesn't take away your faith, but it blurs out your hope. It is an attack on hope. And even if in some cases faith alone can't get someone through this valley, I believe there is nothing more powerful than the Word of God in the battle for your hope. Psalm 31, 14 and 15, But I'm trusting you, O Lord, saying, You are my God. My future is in your hands. Rescue me from those who hunt me down relentlessly. Let your favor shine on your servant. In your unfailing love, rescue me. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. I am praying for you and your loved ones today, that you may have strength to win. In the next episode, we will continue the conversation with Dr. Jen about why antidepressant medications are helpful for some, but not others. Who is the most at risk for depression? And where do we draw the line between helping a loved one struggling with depression and enabling them? Until next time. Thanks for listening to Limitless Spirit with Helen Todd, produced by World Missions Alliance. Are you ready to step out of your comfort zone? Do you have a passion to help people and share your faith across the globe? Visit our website, rfwma.org, and get involved in the Great Commission through short-term missions. We hope you'll leave a review and check out other episodes. We'll be with you in a week on our next episode of Limitless Spirit.